Thank you, Dalton. Appreciate that song, challenging song, great truth. Give your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Tonight in your Bibles as we look at one more sermon on faith and only God. Appreciate you being here tonight. Great crowd tonight. Looking forward to Matthew. Matthew's been coming here for a few months now and uh, watched us online and then got saved and getting baptized tonight. And then the service, that's exciting about that. Always enjoy and excited by someone who follows the Lord in baptism and follows the Lord step by step in a life of faith. That's what we're called to, especially in 2021, is it not? We're called to live a life by faith. And Christians, Christians, we must live a life of faith. Without faith, the Bible tells us, our text tonight, Hebrews 11 and 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. That means that no matter how many church services you come to, no matter how many Bibles you carry, no, how, no many, how many different knots you can tie in your tie, no matter how many times you ride a bus, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's not in what we try to present to God, it's in our faith toward God. Now that faith, like we looked at this morning, will have some action along with it. True faith is a living faith. True faith is not a dead faith. That's what James says. Faith without works is dead being alone. So you can't claim to have faith and to never show any sign of it toward God. God says your faith in me will be shown by how you live. Look in your Bibles, please, in Hebrews chapter 11, one more time in our text for tonight. Hebrews chapter 11, in verse number 6, where the Bible says, But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Question for you, my friend. Do you want to please God? I want to please God. I want one day the Lord to say to me, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Do you know that that's possible? That's just not some idea that, that maybe will happen just to the best Christians and just to the Apostle Paul and to the martyrs. That can happen. That can be reality for you and for me. It's not just for a pastor or an apostle. It, this is for every single Christian can have that report and that statement from the, from the Father, from the Lord. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want Jesus to say that. I want God to say that to me. Don't you? I don't want him to say, boy, you blew it. Is that the report you want? No one likes a bad report card. I want the good report card. I want the Lord to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And it is possible. Sometimes in our lives, we have the idea that it's only going to happen for the really, really, really special Christians. No, my friend, if you're saved, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you have the possibility, you have the potential for Jesus, for God to look at you and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And my Bible says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. So if you're going to please God, you're going to have to walk by faith. That means, my friend, that sometimes it's not going to make sense in the bank account because you have to walk by faith, not by sight. That means that sometimes it's not going to make sense at home. You have to walk by faith and not by sight. It's not going to make sense sometimes with the decisions that you make. That means that sometimes the people around you won't understand you. They think they'll think you're nuts because you're walking by faith and not by sight. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. I want to please the Lord. I want you to please the Lord. I want my children to please the Lord. I want my grandchildren to please the Lord. If Jesus tarries, I hope he doesn't. But if he does, I don't want it to stop just with my wife and I and, and living for the Lord. I hope Johnny, James, and Danielle, the rest of their lives, live for Jesus Christ. I hope that God allows them to do greater things. If I can do anything, that they can do greater things. And I hope if the Lord blesses them with children, I have grandchildren, I hope they do even greater things for Jesus Christ. Hope they live for God. I hope that, that, that the way that I'm raising my children, hopefully it'll, it'll get inside them. Right, that that faith will be real. A young person, that faith can be real for you in the first and second and third grade. That can be real faith right there. Real faith. Not just for your mommies and daddies' faith. It can be your faith. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. You ought to have real faith in Jesus Christ. And that real faith will not only please him, it'll be shown in how you live. It'll be shown in how you live, not just how you show up on a Sunday morning. 
but how you wake up on a Monday morning. Yeah, tomorrow morning, alarm clock's going to go off. How are you waking up? You're waking up in faith or in the flesh? Oh, that's good. Write that down right there. How many times you wake up in the flesh? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know that we have a personal God in the midst of an impersonal world. You can order groceries, have them delivered, and not interact with anyone. You can order food, have them drop it off at your doorstep, and stay behind the safety of a telephone screen or computer screen. You can do your banking. You can go to school. You can even talk to your doctor, teledoc, impersonally. And we live now in an impersonal world, but you and I have a personal God. A God who knows us, a God who loves us, a God who truly wants to know us and be with us on an intimate level. And tonight, there was in this verse a little word that caught my attention. And I want to spend this, the time tonight looking at this. And it's that word, he is a rewarder. Can you say that? He is a rewarder. Sometimes we think of God as a tyrant or a grandfather. And sometimes we think of God as a judge. He is the almighty judge. He's the righteous judge. But this verse doesn't say that, that if you're going to please God, you must believe that he is and that he is a judge, does it? It doesn't say that not only do you believe that he is, he's a judge. It doesn't say that you must believe that he watches you. It says that you must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. Isn't that amazing that in this tremendous proof text on faith that God points us to the goodness of God? And to not only look at this facet of faith, the rewarding goodness of God. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, just a brief few moments we have in comparison to this week. But Lord, I pray that this time would not be a waste of time. Lord, I pray that you would help me as I speak. Lord, help us as we listen to you, the truth from your word. Lord, that you would touch us. Lord, help us to understand it, to grasp this truth. Lord, help us not to miss it. Lord, challenge our hearts tonight. And Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, would they trust you tonight? Would they make today the day of their salvation? Thank you for saving me. Thank you for working in this church. For all that you're doing, we give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. The Bible says that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Three phrases or three, uh, three points tonight in this message. One, two, and three. I want you to notice three things tonight. The first one is this. That as you have faith in God, you must believe. You must act upon this idea that God is intrinsically good. That God is intrinsically good. That means his character is goodness. A life of faith has the foundational thinking right. And foundationally, we must know, we must believe, we must act upon the fact in faith that God is good. Will you say that with me? God is good. Say it one more time. God is good. Now there are sometimes it seems like God is good. There's a phrase sometimes you'll say to someone, God is good, and they'll say back all the time. Kind of like a see you later, bye phrase. I don't know if they always mean that, but that's what someone will respond sometimes. You know that sometimes it seems that God is good when things are going really, really good. The boss calls you and said, man, I can't believe it, but everyone has noticed how you're working right now. In fact, they've noticed it so much that we're going to promote you. With this promotion will come a large raise. We're going to triple your salary. I know that if that were to happen to you tomorrow, that I would most likely or, or almost uh, for sure get a text from you. You won't believe what happened. My boss called me in. They noticed this. I got a promotion and a huge raise. Isn't God good? And I'll respond back, praise the Lord, amen, that's wonderful, and would rejoice with you and pray that you'd be faithful in your giving to the Lord. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I, I jest, I'm just joking. There are times that we, we can see that God is good because life is going well. Everything is smooth. There's no issues at home. There's no problems at work. The bills are just paid and there's money in the bank. The cars are running just right. 
The kids jump to it every single time. It seems like before you ask, life is just going well. And we say, praise the Lord. God is good. And God is good because God is intrinsically good. His character is goodness. But you know what? God is still good when life stinks. You ever have one of those days? Weeks, months, years, decades, life. Pastor, today life stinks. My boss called me in, not to promote me, but to fire me. My car's not running right, in fact, it's not running at all. There's a problem at home. My wife's not happy. My husband's not happy. And my kids, Pastor, I believe that the devil himself has, has, is in the house right now. You have those times? Turned on the faucet and it broke. Faucets only break one way, on. I flushed the toilet, it broke. Toilets un only break one way, stoppage. They come up. Furnace broke. Hot water heater broke. Foundation broke. And a tree fell down. And hit my bicycle. Life stinks right now. A lot harder during those times to utter the phrase and mean it, God is good. We still utter sometimes, but do we mean it? This life of faith, I want to point our attention because the Bible says that God not only is, he is a rewarder. There is an intrinsic goodness to God himself. And sometimes we view God based upon our present circumstances. My friend, when life is going well, God is good. But when life stinks, God is still good. Some would even say he's better when life stinks. God is good. Don't have your view of God determined by your present circumstances. The Bible says that God is goodness. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, Psalm 107, verse 1, for he is good. You can wake up tomorrow and you can claim that verse. God, you're good today, no matter what happens. Lord, if it's, I get an accident on the way to work, you're still good. If I don't, you're good. If I get a promotion today, you're good. If I get fired, you're still good. If it's the same, nothing happens, you're still good. If it's just a plain Jane day, God, you're still good. God is good. The Lord is good. Not only God is, God is goodness, but God is full of goodness. The Bible in Psalm 31 verse 19 says, Oh, how great is thy goodness. God's just not a little bit good. God's just not a medium bit good. God is supersized good. Remember when McDonald's maybe first rolled that out? Do you want to supersize that? They should change that phrase. Do you want to die right now? <laughs> you want a heart attack before or after you walk out of the restaurant? My friend, God is full of goodness. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought, works for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. You know when you see God's goodness and his fullness of goodness? When you trust in God before everyone else. That means when you can't find something, instead of saying, hey, have you seen this? You pray first. Trust in God first. When you have a problem, you don't Google it first. You don't Google it first. You pray first. Blessed, you know, you see the fullness of God when those that trust in thee before the sons of men. Hey, my friend, too often we claim to have faith in God. We claim to please God. But when a problem arises, we don't see the fullness of God's goodness because we turn to the sons of men first. God is goodness. God is full of goodness. And God seeks our goodness. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I read this verse yesterday in my devotions. In reading through the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is a book of judgment, a call to repentance. Over and over, God pleads and says, Listen, if you don't, 
This is what I'm going to do. I'm not happy, God says multiple times. I'm not happy. I'm paraphrasing. I'm not happy. And I'll tell you why I'm not happy. In the midst of the judgment, God says in all this, 28 chapters of judgment and a call to repentance. And then God says, but I know the thoughts I had towards you. And they're thoughts of peace. It struck me because I've been reading the book of Jeremiah and I've been reading these things and I again thought, wow, Lord, you're really upset. You're really, you're really not happy. They've really turned away from you. They're really putting their faith in everything else. And God, you seem to be quite angry. And then God out of the blue says, but the thoughts I have towards you are of peace. You see, God wants to show us peace. God wants to, to show us goodness. God seeks our goodness but he won't put up with a life that's, lack, that's void of faith. God seeks our goodness. You see, sometimes we think that the goodness of God is like eating vegetables. You have to learn to like it. God is not like eating broccoli. Yeah, can I get an amen on that? I don't know what your poison is, apple pie, pizza, steak, whatever it is, God is way better than that. But the Bible says this, Psalm 34, verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Man, God is good. He's not like broccoli, but I happen to like broccoli. Anybody else like broccoli in here? Well, I got some saints in here, amen. Amen. I'll pray for the rest of you. I remember when Johnny was real, real small, he's learning to eat. We're feeding him. Johnny loved the fruit. Peaches, apricots. One night, my wife was going to go grocery shopping or something like that. She ran some errands. She said, hey, honey, you have to feed Johnny. And I don't have any uh, whatever fruit it was, peach or apricots, apricots, but I have a can of green beans. First time father, naive, naive. Not been married too long at that point. Now I know more. My wife was setting me up for failure. She was. I said, okay, honey, I think I even asked her, will you like this? Oh, yes, yes, yes. And she, the door slammed while she's answering the question. You know, man, how it goes. And so we sit down, and, and Johnny, like a good howl, like a good howl, loves to eat and loves to eat then. And, and he would smack his lips like little kids do. And, and uh, no, no airplane with Johnny. You could open it up. He'd just keep like, ah, you know, he like this. So I open that can. He sees the can. I got the little spoon, a little white tip spoon, you know, and like this. He's like, you know, like this, I put that in his mouth. Hey. <laughs> Projectile green beans. <laughs> I thought to myself, okay, Doreen. Okay, I see how this is. I got my phone out. So I'm going to record this from Mama. Giving me green beans to feed my son, my firstborn son, named after me. Named after me. Boy needs apricots, not green beans. Recorded it the second time and fed him. Johnny was a little more tentative this time. Not so many smacks. Put it back in, but he didn't disappoint. And I taped it. I said, aha. And I said, Johnny, you're done. No more food for you. I'm not, I'm not forcing you to eat this green beans. You know that. Sometimes we view, we view God that way, that God's goodness is like broccoli and green beans. Okay, God, I know what you're going to do is good for me. All right, let me have it. Okay. Oh, oh, oh forced it down. Oh, all right. Boy, God is good all the time. God's not like broccoli and green beans, my friend. God is good, he's full of goodness, and he seeks our goodness. Since that point, my children have grown to like vegetables. They're strange children. One time, one of my kids wanted to swap out fries for broccoli. Restaurant said, re 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 restaurant said you know what, we'll have to upcharge you. That's what's wrong with America. When a child asks for broccoli instead of of fries, and, and they say, well, I have to charge you more. They should have said, you know, we'll give you all the broccoli because it's, no one else is eating it here, this restaurant. <laughs> God's not like broccoli. He is good for us, but he is good. And my friend, the longer you spend with God, you will find out that it's not just a, uh, um, a it's not just that you grow to like him, all right? You'll, you'll see that he's good. 
It's not just an acquired taste. He is good. And when you taste him, you'll find out that God is good. He's intrinsically good. Oh, man. The little boy, he was praying at a restaurant. Real young in life. And as he prayed, he got a little stumbled up with his words. A little stumbled up with this restaurant. He said, God is good and God is great. We thank him today for the food. And we'd be real thankful if mama could get us some ice cream. Amen. Apparently a pious lady was sitting close enough at another table where she could hear that. And had to say something. Oh, you know those, you know those people. The stories about a lady could have been a man, though. The ones who have to say something. Well, that wasn't a very good prayer, young man. The mother tried to console her child. He looked at his mom. Mom, was it bad? And then an older gentleman came by. He leaned down the table and he said, Young man, I happen to know something. That was a wonderful prayer. I happen to know that Jesus was happy with that. In fact, ice cream is good and good for the soul for you. Well, and he said, by the way, that lady there probably never asked for ice cream either. <laughs> now, sure enough, mom bought them ice cream. The young man got his ice cream, the little boy got his ice cream as he looked at it. Looked back at that lady who was over there. Thought about what that man said, that ice cream was good, and she probably never asked for it. He walked over to that table and he said, Ma'am, you probably never had ice cream from God. You can have mine. My friend, when you live life in faith that God is good, my friend, you can pass it around. You can be a testimony to other people. Listen, my friend, you may have never had ice cream from God, but it's good. God is good. God is intrinsically good. And a life of faith sees the goodness of God. You got a bad attitude, you're not walking by faith. If you're having a pity party, woe is me, you're not seeing the goodness of God. You're walking by sight. A life of faith sees that God is a rewarder. He is intrinsically good. God, in a life of faith, shows his goodness. Not only is he intrinsically good, number two, he identifies genuineness. Not only does he, is he good, but he identifies those who are genuine. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, God knows who is real and who's just a phony full of baloney. Are you the real deal? I'm not asking if you're perfect. There's none of us that are perfect inside this room. None of us. We're going to make mistakes. What I'm asking is if you're genuine. Is you, if you can say from your heart, God, I'm trying to follow you. God, I'm trying with, with your grace and with your strength. Lord, I'm trying to, to live a life of faith. Now, you can maybe fool me and you can fool those around you. You can show up here and you can show up on, on Wednesday night. You can look real good and act real good and bring a big Bible and say amen at, at the right time. But God knows those who are real and those who are phonies. God knows who's a fake. You can't fool the almighty God. Oh, the Bible is filled with these statements. Jeremiah 17, early in the book of Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, I don't like that verse. It says, in my heart and your heart's wicked. Desperately wicked. Above all things, it's deceitful. That's the question you can know it in. Verse number 10 in Jeremiah 17 answers the question, I, the Lord, search the heart. God knows your heart. He knows where you're at. He says, I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. You see, God identifies genuineness. And if you're genuine in a life of genuine faith, he knows that. He knows if you're a fake. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. The Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't care about what's out here. It just means that God cares more about what's in here. And you can fool me. You can say, well, Pastor, it's great to see you. And then, and then stab me in the back as you walk away. And that's okay. I'm pretty secure. I'll still love you. I'll still like you. And you can act like, a, like the 100% Christian, but God knows if you're 100 or if you're just a zero. God knows that. 
And my friend, you can't live a life that pleases God being a spiritual faith zero. You can't do it. You can't just say amen and expect to please the Lord. You have to live a life that's genuine faith. Proverbs 21, verse 2. Every way of, of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord, he pondereth the hearts. Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and he is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God knows your true motives. He knows that, that when you take that step, step of faith, when you walk or when you give, he knows if your motive is faith or if it's selfishness. He knows if you're walking by faith or just by sight. You can't fool. I can't fool God. Sometimes they're Christians who just play the game. We're pretty good at playing the game, aren't we? Aren't we? You can have the fight of your life on the way to church. And as you pull in the church, you see me. Hi, Pastor. Hi, Pastor. Great to be at church today. Got my Bible. Oh, wow. Praise the Lord. Shut up. <laughs> see you inside. Ready to, hear, well, ready to hear your message today. That Well, that's great. God knows if you're generally just a fake. God knows that. Ananias and Sapphira. Boy, they were... They were some generous givers. They were going to turn some heads in the church when they brought their offering. They were going to be the talk of the church because they sold some land and they're giving all of it to God except that they weren't. Except that they weren't. And I imagine that the church would have been fooled by their gifts if God hadn't said, listen, you're trying to deceive everyone around you. You're lying. You're lying. You, you see, they could have just given part of it and said this is just part of it. They didn't have to give all of it. There's no one in the Bible that says you have to sell land and give it all. But there is things in the Bible that talks about not being deceitful and being genuine. You can't fool God. Hmm. There's a man being led to the block martyr for Jesus Christ. As he laid down his head on the block, the executioner asked him if his head was set just right for him, if he was comfortable, if his head was right. Can you imagine that? The nerve of that is about to chop off your head. Is it, is it just right? You feel okay? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> A little something in my stomach right now. Uh, but the, the man who's being led, Sir Walter, said, It matters little, my friend, how my head lies, provided my heart is right. Here in the presence of God, he went on to say, Before him, through whom are revealed the secrets of all hearts, here before the cross of mercy and of love, what does your heart speak, and how does your heart lie? That's the question, isn't it? Matters not how my head lies. Matters how my heart lies before him. Matters how I stand in genuineness before God. And he sees it all. He sees it all. Now he sees the bad, but he also sees the good. Maybe your motives have been misjudged. God never misjudged a single motive. God knows exactly what we are. And what to do for us. You see, God is not only intrinsically good and he identifies genuineness. Last night, God, as a rewarder for them to diligently seek him, is inherently generous. Intrinsically, he's, his character inherently means that he works along these lines. He's guided by this principle that he is a generous God. What is that reward? Well, some would think it worth it to follow God for a piece of junk called a Ferrari. You know that, right? That if everyone who followed God got a Ferrari, this church would be full to capacity. If someone got something that will rust and fall apart and cost you something, a Ferrari, 
that people would flock from around the world to get this thing called a Ferrari. In fact, if we're honest, if tonight God said, well, thank you for coming to church tonight. Thank you for being genuine. You're going to get a new Ferrari tomorrow. I don't think we'd be disappointed, would we? Huh, Ferrari. Well, really, Lord, I want a Lamborghini. There's always one in the crowd, is there not? <laughs> really, Lord, a Ferrari? Oh, boy. No, we'd be pretty excited about that. And next week, the place would be full. That church, they all, God gave them Ferraris. And isn't it interesting that we would view the generosity of God no larger than a gasoline engine and some rubber put together in a way that, that looks pleasing and goes quickly. God is so much more generous than a Ferrari. He's so much more generous than a big house or a luscious vacation property. Yet if that's what God blessed you with and that was it, there are those who would say, wow, God is so good. God is so much more gracious than abundant pension for life or a life of ease, of prosperity, free of trials and trouble and flat tires and moldy bread. God is so much better. In fact, if we're not careful, we think the generosity of God is like unicorns and, and popcorn and cotton candy. But God is inherently generous. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to one other passage tonight. Turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 gives us and shows us the generosity of God. Genesis 15, a powerful truth, a truth that I hope that God will touch your heart with tonight, that you will walk away. If you don't hear anything else, hear this truth. When God, what he gives us, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and Thy exceeding great, what's the last word? Reward. You know what God said to Abram? Eventually changed his name to Abraham. God said, let me show you my generosity. Let me show you just how good I am. I am going to give you myself. The God of the universe, creator of all life, supreme controller, says, I'm going to give you if you follow me, myself. Who cares about a Ferrari? Who cares about a pension? Who cares about a big house? Who cares about the latest, greatest, fancy tools and gadgets, whatever floats your heart desires? God says, I'm going to be generous and I'm going to give you myself. couple was celebrating 50 years of marriage. Ken, they told him, 50 years is a long, long time. And Ken immediately responded, yes it is, but not nearly so long as it would have been without her. My friend, life with Jesus Christ, life with God, Amazing. Full. And if tonight, if in your heart, if there are those thoughts, that's it, all I get is God, then my friend, you're missing the point of faith. You're missing walking by faith. When you can sit there and say, you know what? All I have is Jesus, but all I need is Jesus. And all I want is Jesus. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name, but his love abideth ever through eternal years the same. With Jesus in the picture, there's no problems. There's no problems. There may be issues, but there are no problems. Like we looked at this morning, is there anything too hard for God? Morris was a loudmouth mechanic. He was working on a motor one day inside a shop, and he happened to see a famous heart surgeon over to the side. And Morris shouted across the garage, Hey, Doc, is that you? 
Come over here. I gotta talk to you. So the famous heart surgeon, famous heart doctor, walk over to Morris, the loudmouth mechanic. And Morris straightened up, wiped off his hands, and he asked this doctor, a little bit argumentatively, so Mr. Fancy Doctor, I got a question for you. You see, me and you, we do the same kind of work. I, I, I open up engines, you open up people's engines. You take out valves, I take out valves. You cut and grind a little bit, I cut and grind a little bit. And you put them back together, I put them back together. When you're done, they purr like a kitten. When I'm done, they purr like a kitten. So tell me, Mr. Fancy Doctor, why do you get paid so much? And I'm just making this as measly salary as a mechanic. I'm a famous heart surgeon. A little bit of wisdom. He said, Morris, there's one key difference. Try doing what you do with the engine running. You see what God does every single day. He can do what he does with the engine running. Skillfully, masterfully, beautifully. And he is inherently generous. Oh, he's inherently generous. He graciously gives us himself, but he still gives us good gifts. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. C.S. Lewis said, if we consider the staggering nature of the rewards that God has promised us in the Gospels. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires and heart not too strong, but too weak. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Someone said this, I asked for health that I might do greater things, but I was given an infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for strength that I might achieve, but I was made weak that I might learn how to obey and trust. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power and the praise of men. I was given weakness to sense my need of God. I asked for all the things that I might enjoy in life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing I asked for but everything I hoped for. I was among all men most richly blessed because all, God always gives what is best. Elderly missionary couple, given a lifetime of serving God in Africa, they buried two of their children on the continent. Their health was spent. Now they're coming home on a steamer. So happened that President Teddy Roosevelt was also returning home on that same steamer from a hunting safari in Africa. And the steamer pulled into the, the port, and as the president disembarked off the steamer, bands were playing, folks were cheering, balloons, a lot of hoopla. Eventually, the other passengers were allowed to disembark. Elderly couple, as they walked off down the plank, looked around. Crowds were gone. Trash littered the port. Bands had packed up. No one cheering them home. With tears rolling down her cheeks, the wife looked at her husband and said, Why? Why does the president get all this? Returning from a safari. And we've given all for Jesus Christ for 40 years. Our health broken. Our kids buried. There's no welcome home. My friend, if we're honest, sometimes we feel that way. Sometimes we want to walk by faith, but our faith is weak. Her husband, her godly husband, brushed her tears away. Looked deep in his dear wife's eyes and simply said, Honey, we're not home yet. My friend, without faith, it is impossible to please him. But with faith, God makes the impossible of pleasing him possible. 
we believe that he is, we find out that he's a rewarder, that he's good, and he's good all the time. We find out that he's no, he knows what's good and what's real. We find out he gives what is good. My friend, are you living a life to please God tonight? He knows. He knows. He knows about tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday. I want to stand before him one day. I want to hear those words. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Lord, I thank you for your word tonight. Lord, I pray you'd search our hearts. Lord, you know if we're living a life of faith that'll please you. But I pray you'd challenge us tonight. I don't know that I did a good job explaining the truth from your word, Lord, but I pray your spirit would touch us tonight. But maybe there's someone here who has doubted your goodness, but maybe right now life stinks for them. Lord, may they come back to you and live a life of faith for you. Or maybe there's someone here who's been just doing the motions, going through the motions, being phony. Lord, may we walk and live a life of faith. Lord, thank you for giving us yourself. Piano's playing. My friend, of God's touched your heart, the altar's open. You come now. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not sure you're on your way to heaven. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. My friend, tonight can be the night where you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. We'd love to open up a Bible and show you how that God loves you. Jesus died for you. You can put your faith for all eternity in Jesus Christ. You can trust him. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. My friend, you may be here tonight and you never trusted Jesus Christ. In just a moment, we'll stand to our feet. If that's you, I pray you'd come to the front. We have folks who will meet you. We'll open a Bible, a man if you're a man, a lady if you're a lady. But don't leave the night without talking to someone about this thing called faith. Lord, bless this invitation. May we be honest before you in Jesus' name. Amen.